Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to open our session called DCB Finally Ready for Prime Time. My name is Bruno Scheller from uh, Saarland University Hospital in uh, Germany. And I, uh, with me here on the podium are uh, Raban Jäger from Zürich in Switzerland uh, and Victor Jimenez. Um, if, <laughs> if, um, and um, the objective of the session today is to um, um, give us new insights when comparing uh, Paclitaxel and Serolimus uh, for a truck rooted balloon. Uh, we want to learn about practical experiences in large vessel and bifurcations when using DCB. And we want to get an understanding on how to combine the use of DCB with drug looting stands um, in various indications. Um, and it's a great pleasure for me to um, ask my friend uh, Raban Jäger um, to give us his talk uh, about reinventing PCI, it's a big title, uh, DCB in the Novo Large Vessel Treatment. Raban. Okay. Bruno, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's uh, really nice to see you all here. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when we had the same Congress and we were talking about drug coated balloon. Uh, I think it was a room of uh, five people or something. And now it has gained uh, momentum. DCB are now in the middle of uh, the discussion. I think it's very important and that we can exchange our opinions and, uh, and discuss things uh, that are important. Um, Today, my task is to speak about truck coated balloons in de novo large vessel treatment. Uh, these are my disclosures, and I want to start with this picture. Um, this is the iconic picture of Andreas Grünzig. Uh, 45 years ago, he did the first PTCA in Zurich. This is the place where I work. And uh, he, at that time, used a really basic material. You see, he holds in his left hand a Chotkin's left cathedral with a, with a balloon. And this balloon was manufactured in the, I think, in the kitchen, a couple of meters away from the cath lab. Um, and at that time, he did an intervention in a large vessel. You see on the right side, uh, the picture of 1977. This is the proximal LAD. And 23 years later, uh, Bernie Meyer, the former chief uh, of cardiology in Bern, and at that time, the student in the cath lab, um, he did another angiography on this patient, and he saw an excellent result. And this was the, uh, the first uh, POBA, as we call it today, intervention that was successful. However, not all of these interventions were successful. Um, of course, you know, dissections, acute vessel closures, acute reco recoil and restenosis occurred. And therefore, this was not an intervention that worked in every patient due to the basic material, due to the lacking anticoagulation. And therefore, there were the stents. And you see here a picture of Uli Sigwart. Um, he holds really a large stent in his hand. He was one of the first implanting stents. Um, in the middle of the 80s, were a couple of groups implanting stents, and uh, these bare metal stents, as we call them today, uh, today had some problems, as you know, uh, mainly the instant restenosis problem. And then we had uh, the truck eluting stents, and there were, has lots, lots been talking about uh, truck eluting stents. Um, uh, today, they are the mainstay of interventional therapy, um, but they have an Achilles heel, they have a problem. And this is uh, very nicely depicted here. This is a really huge analysis of 25,000 patients coming from 19 trials. Um, and you see here that um, these stents, bare metal stents, First generation drug eluting stents, second generation drug eluting stents, they have different event rates in the first year, but afterwards they are all the same and they are all the, uh, in, a, in the same way not good, not working because they have an event rate of 2% per year, all stents um, irrespective of the desi design have the same uh, problem. 
And therefore, here in this paper and uh, uh, anywhere else, this uh, new techniques looked for, and uh, one of these techniques apparently is the drug-coated balloons. That's why we are sitting here, and that's uh, why we are discussing this. Drug-coated balloons, um, I, I just show you this picture here. This is the central illustration of the third report of the DCB consensus group, and in the central illustration, in the centrum, is the lesion preparation, which is the basis of all DCB interventions. You have to have a good result before you use um, uh, the DCB, and this is um, really important, and. Uh, Probably we will discuss, it, uh, discuss this later as well. But as soon as you have an acceptable, acceptable result, you can use the DCB. Just to give you a flavor, um, this is a, a case uh, that has uh, uh, been done in my institution. It was a patient, a uh, 54-year-old uh, poor guy with an acute coronary syndrome. He has been treated with drug-eluting stents twice, um, and he has two stent layers in the proximal LAD. And now he has this tight stenosis of the RCX with a thrombus lying in there. And uh, this is um, the situation, and this has been um, treated with a DCB-only approach here in this situation. Um, was a pre-dilatation with, in this case, a non-compliant balloon, uh, 3.25 uh, millimeters. Uh, this is the drug-coated balloon that followed. And after this treatment, there was some kissing and potting done. And at the end, we had a really nice res result. This patient is a victim of, uh, can you say when you are uh, uh, evil, thinker, uh, a victim of DES therapy, and uh, this patient has been treated with a drug-coated balloon, and I think uh, with very good result, and I think this, this situation, uh, re instant restenosis after drug-eluting stents, and this hybrid approach with a new device, this is the thing we have to discuss. So we want to talk about uh, PCI in large vessel in de novo disease. Um, we uh, we have, don't have a lot of data here, but uh, what we have is data from uh, different trials and from smaller randomized trials and from observational studies. I start with the basket small two trial, which was um, a trial in smaller vessels. Um, showed non-inferiority uh, between DCB and DES. Um, for over three years, and we have been done a subgroup analysis in the very small and the not so small vessels, and you see here that is uh, exactly the same result. And so there's no sign of problem here with larger vessel. Um, the next trial I want to show is PEPCOT non STEMI. This is uh, uh, the trial of Bruno Scheller. He was the, PC, uh, the, the PI of this, not the PCI, the PI. Mr. PCI was PI of this uh, trial. And uh, the remarkable thing here is this trial included all vessel sizes from 2.5 to 4. And uh, in a way, this was an all common trial in acute coronary syndromes. The problem here, uh, half of the uh, comparator group were, were bare metal stents, and so this was not a, a true uh, DES versus DCB trial. Um, but you see here that the vessel size was at about three millimeters, not that small, but not too large. Another trial I want to highlight here is the debut trial. Uh, Thomas Rissanen did this trial and compared in a non-inferiority design DCB against BMS in high-risk bleeding patient. Again, no restriction in vessel size here. Um, again, a clinical endpoint. Um, and you see here that in this trial, we had quite a lot of large vessels, the mean device diameter was three millimeters, and there were a considerable uh, amount of large vessel interventions here. And again, no sign of problem. 
Then we go to uh, observational data. Um, lots of this observational data comes from the group of Simon Ecclesall. And uh, this Spartan DCB study showed in, uh, uh, in more than 1,500 patients with a long follow-up of uh, uh, how many? Five years. Yes, it's very small. Five years that DCB were at least as good as DES and the vessel size here was um, even larger than three millimeters. Uh, for the DCB, it was 3.06 millimeters. And so uh, the vessel size is getting bigger and bigger. Um, the same group published this paper um, in, again, elective all comer patients. And uh, you see here that in these 1,000 patients, this propensity score matched cohort, uh, again, no sign of problem. The ES is uh, having more events than the DCB group. And the vessel size here is, uh, again, 3 millimeters for DCB and 3.5 for DS. And um, you see here that uh, even in larger vessels, there seems not to be a problem. Um, interesting here is that the dissection grade after DCB um, shows that um, in 40% of patients or 45% of patients, there were dissections that could easily be left and not uh, needed any intervention. Now, look, uh, let's look at the randomized trials um, uh, for DCB against DES. Um, there is not a lot of data around. You see here this uh, meta-analysis in the field. Um, this meta-analysis shows that we only have small patient groups and we only have um, uh, angiographic endpoints. But again, here there's not a, a problem apparently um, in this group. I just show you the, f the largest of these trials, the Revelation trial that tested DCB versus DS in STEMI patients. The endpoint was FFR at nine months, and their uh, non inferiority was established. But when we look at the Vessel size, you see that the reference vessel diameter was 3.3 millimeters in DCB and 3.2 in DS. And the, um, the clinical endpoint were uh, really identical in the two groups, 3% um, of TLR in the DCB and 2% in the DS group. Now, what, what's next? Next is... Uh, um, a large randomized clinical trial in all comers um, aiming at clinical endpoint and the comparison would be DES versus DCB and one of these trial is, uh, trials is already running the solution de novo trial this is a sirolimus coated balloon uh, from Cordis now uh, that is being tested in 3,326 patients with a one-year follow-up. Uh, or the, the, the primary endpoint is one-year uh, target vessel failure. And interesting here is that um, there are two strategies being tested. One strategy is uh, the DCB strategy uh, that includes DES patients, so um, there will be a group of patients receiving both therapies, and the other one is a DES only group. And here we are, um, I think, at 1,100 patients included already. Um, I think a very important point is that this is not an either-or therapy. DCP is one um, piece of, uh, of therapy you can give your patients, but it's not excluding the other one. And this is very important to, to show here. Um, in this trial um, from Shin from South Korea, um, in the DCB-based group, there were also some DES patients, but the reduction of DES uh, showed a really uh, a better result over time. Okay, I want to uh, stop with this slide to wrap up. Um, the first PTSA was performed balloon only. Intervention was performed in 1977 and had an excellent long-term outcome. DS are the default strategy at the moment, but uh, these stents have problems uh, uh, continuously yearly, event rate of 2%. And the data is not good at the moment, but we have increasingly more data and reassurance that DCB and large 
uh, vessels can be used. Um, a DCB-only approach is, in my opinion, not necessary. A hybrid approach is sometimes really better. Uh, the main thing is to reduce the amount of metallic implants in the patients uh, to, uh, or in order to reduce the clinical event rates. But we all are eagerly waiting for randomized studies in the field to, uh, to build up data and to give good results to our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? Not yet, so may I, I start with one question, Raban. Um, if I tell people I treat the proximal LD only with DCB, everybody says this is too dangerous, you have to stand it, you have to be on the safe side, um, and this is a large vessel. Are there, what, 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 what is it? Should we avoid proximal mm -hmm. LED or can we do it? Um, I think the, the discussion is about the, 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 the risk of the patient. We have, when we stand or treat with a DCB, the proximal LED, there's a lot of uh, myocardium at risk and therefore um, we all were uh, born um, with uh, the knowledge that only a stent can help. Um, I have seen lots of stent thrombosis in the proximal LED. Um, I wouldn't be that sure that um, you, you are safer with a stent than with a DCB. And on the other side, what, what we have from clinical data is that after a, a proper pre-dilatation, a good result after pre-dilatation, and um, a, um, a good balloon you're using, you almost never have uh, acute vessel closure. This has been proven in, in basket small too. We have this data, uh, other data is the same. So. I think with, uh, with good results and a good balloon, you can uh, go home and have a night uh, without interruption. I think it's very interesting, the results that you have presented regarding the treatment with DCB in large vessels. But also we know that we have a lot of data uh, using DCB in a small vessel disease. So I think the results and the long-term outcome would be very comparable between both. But the case that you presented was completely interesting because it was an acute coronary syndrome. It has thrombos uh, in the ostium of the left circumflex. So what is your thought regarding treating these patients with acute coronary syndrome, but not only that, with, with thrombus formation, because mm -hmm. we want to deliver the drug in the vessel while not in the thrombus. How should we deal with this? Um, I showed you the results of the PEPCOT non-STEMI trial, the revelation trial in, in STEMI, um, it seems to be safe to use DCBs in, uh, in STEMIs. However, um, a thrombus is always a big problem. It's also a problem for stents. Um, uh, you never know how big you have to, to inflate the, the stent. And um, I think the, the drug on the balloon uh, eventually doesn't go into the vessel wall when you use uh, a, a drug coated balloon with lots of thrombus but um, I think this is the not, not it's not the better option but at least uh, uh, as uh, the, the, the same option or the, the same uh, level of option like in drug eluting stents where you don't know how, how big you have to inflate it so it's uh, I think it's uh, it's not a problem and uh, trials have shown that uh, apparently they, there's not a, uh, a bad result with it. Uh, when, when talking to people who are not using DCB every day and then say okay we can use it for instant restenosis but not for the novo um, when you ask them what could be indications in the novo day uh, the, the first answer is small vessels and uh, we have several randomized trials including basket small 2 uh, what, what, what trial designs do we need to, to look at larger vessels for, for DCB mm. treatment? I think the, um, uh, you never will be better than drug eluting stents. I think you, you have to prove that you are uh, at least as good as the drug eluting stents. And uh, I think the, the design, for example, the solution trial um, is, is really nice that you, you can um, use both devices or both kind of devices in the same patients. It's not an either or. Um, and I think 
therefore, there is no restriction for the use of DCBs. If you have a good result, um, you don't need to put a stent. But if the result is not good, then you have the, uh, the possibility to use the stent that stents are made for. Uh, but it's not uh, a God-given law that you have to, to stand every, every lesion uh, that is around in the heart. And is this more a strategy trial or more a trial uh, based on, on, on the lesion? Because mm. strategy trial means that you randomize before you do anything and you end up with a... A hybrid approach in the DCB mm -hmm. group and a pure stand approach in the stand group. Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, I think to to prove to the community that uh, the the principle is working, you probably need to do a strategy trial, or not a, uh, a lesion uh, based trial. Mm. Okay. It's also interesting because there is some lesion characteristic when you can use DCBs. I think in all lesion you can try at least to use it, but also clinical feature of the patient that. Uh, may uh, induce to use more DCB than a stent in, in some situation that have to be yeah. taken into the formula, into account into the formula. Yeah. For example, bleeding patients or uh, uh, diabetics. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Okay. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, we will go to the next topic. You know that um, so far the majority of evidence comes from um, Pactitaxel for drug coated balloons. Um, meanwhile, we have um, uh, upcoming projects, upcoming data from um, Cerulimus or Biolums um, uh, for drug balloon coating. And um, this is my conflict of interest. And I will give you a short overview on the current stage of uh, Limus versus Paclitaxel coated balloons. Um, I want to start with one remark. Paclitaxel is safe. One of the arguments against Paclitaxel is that it is cytotoxic, but yes, it is cytotoxic, but only in concentration higher than 100 nanogram per milligram in the tissue, and this is normally not reached with, um, with DCB, and if, if it is reached, it is only within the first few hours. So the toxicity of Paclitaxel in DCB application is the same as with Sorolimus. And this may explain why we have seen in this large meta-analysis in 400, 500, 4,500 patients no safe designs when using Paclitaxel coated balloons. Uh, we see a lower rate of myocardial infarction within the first year and uh, some signs of reduced cardiac uh, mortality after three years. Um, this shows you uh, again the, uh, the cytotoxicity um, uh, discussion. Once again, if you are keep in the tissue below this, this level, you have the same cytotoxicity as serolimus. And here you can see the tissue uh, concentration with uh, paclitaxel coated balloons, uh, which is clearly below this uh, uh, threshold. And furthermore, if we are talking about therapeutic windows, the difference between local therapy and systemic therapy uh, is for Paclitaxel much higher than it is uh, for Serolimus. So I think uh, these safety discussions uh, about uh, Paclitaxel um, are not founded by, by, by science. Uh, if we talk about different agents for balloon-based coating, we have to be aware that with the balloon you have a single inflation where you have to uh, deliver all the drug to the vessel wall, and after that you have to guarantee that the drug works for a longer period of time. This is relatively easy with uh, Zerolimus because we have a irreversible binding to the microtubes. Uh, with Zerolimus, there is a uh, reversible binding to the mTOR receptor complex, and this means that you have to take care when working with Zerolimus that uh, you have uh, persistent tissue levels over a certain amount of time. Um, one important aspect, we have no final answer, but we have some, some science, is the question of late loom enlargement. You know that if we uh, uh, treat a native coronary artery without stent implantation only with balloon-based approach, it's a rare event that you have a stent-like result. Normally you end up with a, some kind of residual stenosis and with Paclitaxel coated balloons we have seen that there is an effect called late loom enlargement which means after, typically after four months you have an increase um, in uh, uh, vessel lumen, and this may be uh, contributed to the fact that we have an accumulation of Paclitaxel in the adventitia, which uh, is not the case uh, for Serolimus. 
Um, we started more than 10 years ago with the first experiments with Sotarolimus. At this time, there was a biological effect uh, shown. However, there were uh, issues with the total amount of, of amount of truck you had to deliver, so uh, this project was stopped. This is the current landscape of uh, Sirolimus or Biolimus coated balloons in the coronary field, at least the, the relevant programs we have information about. Um, and these are different uh, concepts. I want to go into uh, detail a little bit more. Um, this slide shows you that there are differences um, in acute tissue transfer, but this may be due to the fact that, that different metallurgy uh, to measure has been used in animal models. But if you say you have a similar drug transfer, you can see that there are differences in the drug persistence um, over a longer period of time, typically measured at one week and four weeks. Um, the first concept is not a DCB, it's a um, porous balloon, the, the virtue balloon, uh, who delivers um, a pharmaceutical solution to the vessel wall. This is uh, using serolimus. And they could demonstrate in the animal model <coughs> good persistence of the of the truck of the over a longer period of time. Here it is uh, one month. And we have also uh, published a clinical trial, a non-randomized uh, trial with 50 patients. And we have the data of the of all patients and uh, the pair protocol treated patients. And for um, <coughs> instant restenosis, we see a late lumen loss of 0.3 and 0.12. Um, so far, we have no further randomized uh, data on this approach. Um, the next concept is the, the magic touch uh, using uh, phospholipid encapsulation for serolimus. And uh, for this balloon here, you can see that the tissue concentration um, has a, a sharp decline uh, within the uh, first days and uh, up to uh, two weeks. Um, uh, there are several published registries on this balloon, but no randomized trial. And we hoped uh, to learn about the data of the Transform 1 trial tomorrow, but this unfortunately will not be the case. A larger trial is ongoing, the Transform 2 trial, and um, there's also some activity on FDA approval on this balloon. The next technology, which has also already been shown by Raban, is the uh, Solution um, Serolmus balloon. Um, <coughs> they use a proprietary uh, formulation of micro reservoirs. And here you can see the, the tissue concentration up to 60 days, which shows the persistence of the drug. Um, so far, there's no published randomized data, um, but the solution trial is ongoing. And uh, Simon Eggelschall told me that they had have more than 1,000 patients meanwhile in the trial. Um, the next concept is a <coughs> biolimus coated balloon. Um, for this balloon, the, uh, uh, it was investigated in the BioRise China study. And uh, it was a small vessel trial, and they are randomized against um, POBA. And um, in this trial, there was a, a significant reduction of late loom loss from 0.3 uh, with POBA to 0.16 millimeters, thank you, <laughs> um, in the biolimus coated balloon group. Oh. You your yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, if you look at uh, Lumen enlargement, which is called positive remodeling here. We see this effect in uh, about 10% in the POBA group, which is in line with the reported data from the literature, and in 30% of the lesions of the uh, biolimus coated balloon group. And tomorrow there will be another randomized trial of this balloon against um, uh, sequent please in uh, instant restenosis. Um, we started. Uh, Preclinically, uh, more than 10 years ago, with different formulations of serolimus. And um, as you can see here, uh, we uh, investigated um, amorphous coatings, mixed coatings, and to highly crystalline coatings. And there were significant differences in the um, uh, tissue concentration at four weeks, for example. And finally, uh, there was a highly crystalline concentration with four microcom per square millimeter balloon surface which had a, a very good drug transfer and uh, persistence of the drug in the vessel wall up to four weeks. Um, this um, um, coating was tested meanwhile in three published randomized clinical trials. The first in men trial was 
conducted in Malaysia in instant restenosis. 50 patients randomized to either the paclitaxel coated sequin please balloon or the uh, serolimus coated balloon. And <coughs> here you can see the primary endpoint, late lumen loss. And this was not significantly different between paclitaxel and serolimus 0.21 in the paclitaxel coated balloon group and 0.17 in the Zerolimus coated balloon and <coughs> non inferiority in this primary endpoint for the Zerolimus coated balloon was reached, therefore. Um, in parallel, we conducted um, the same trial in Europe, in Germany and Switzerland, with, uh, together with Raman, and uh, we could double the patient number to 101. Um, um, interesting to see that the um, study populations differed a little bit between uh, Malaysia and Europe. In Europe, the patients were 10 years older. Um, in contrast, the patients in uh, Malaysia had a significantly higher rate of, of diabetes. But overall, um, the results could be confirmed. And if you look at the total uh, population, late loss in segment was almost the same, 0.26 in the serolimus coated balloon and 0.25 in the paclitaxel coated balloon. <coughs> and here you can see the uh, late loom loss distribution, which is uh, almost the same between two groups, and here the MLD distribution. Um, also, at one year, no uh, differences in clinical events. Um, another trial conducted in Malaysia, <coughs> again, compared the paclitaxel coated balloon with the serolimus coated balloon, but in the novo lesions. Um, 70 patients randomized one to one. And here um, we, we could again see non inferiority of the serolimus coated balloon against the paclitaxel coated balloon with late loom loss with serolimus of 0.1 and 0 0.01 uh, with paclitaxel. If you look uh, <coughs> more in detail on um, um, lumen enlargement, which is called here in segment late lumen loss negative. Um, with the raw limus, we could see 32% um, uh, lumen enlargement and 60% in the paclitaxel coated balloon group. And this compares very well to the BioRas China group, where for the biolimus uh, balloon, there was also a similar improvement in lumen enlargement. So that we can say, accordingly to this first data, there seems to be different in late lumen enlargement between POBA Limus-based balloon and paclitaxel-based balloon. So this is the uh, overview of the ongoing study program with the sequent SCB. We have published the two trials uh, for instant restenosis, the two mechanistic trials. Um, the de novo trial is already published. Uh, we will present the data of the de novo trial in Europe later this year. In addition, we're waiting for the uh, data of the China uh, trial of 220 patients uh, in ISR. And a large registry is ongoing. And uh, we hope to start a larger randomized trial um, with the serolimus coated balloon against uh, drug eluting stents in the novo disease later this year. So my conclusion is, <coughs> at this time, uh, paclitaxel coated balloons uh, remain the standard. Uh, since there is the largest clinical evidence so far. Um, Serolimus coated balloons um, require specific techniques to um, uh, guarantee for long persistence of the drug in the vessel wall. Um, there is very limited published clinical data from randomized trials so far. And therefore, we need larger trials and serious clinical signs um, in the future. And this normal <coughs> SCB with the crystalline coating was non-inferior to the best investigated paclitaxel coated balloons, balloon in ISR and de novo. Um, and of course, we need longer follow-up and larger trials to confirm these results. And of course, uh, class effect also in SCB is unlikely. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Any question from the audience? I think we've got <coughs> one question over there. From Bern. Um, you mentioned the phenomenon of uh, late lumen enlargement. I recently had a patient presenting with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, 
of total occlusion of a large OM1 and uh, a tight stenosis of an OM2. And uh, the OM1 was treated with a 3 millimeter stent, and I treated the, the OM2 with a 2.5 um, Pantera Lux drug coated balloon. Now, the patient uh, also had a chronic occlusion of the RPA, and um, when I brought him back four weeks later to do the right, there was an aneurysm at the at the site where I did the, the inflation with the drug-coated balloon. And uh, the, the vessel, the native vessel, was about 2.5 millimeters, and the aneurysm was up to 4 millimeters. So I thought, okay, I haven't seen this before. I left it as it was, but I brought the patient back um, three months later, and the aneurysm had grown to six millimeters. And um, while well, I didn't feel very comfortable, so I'm, I'm not a friend of, uh, of graft stents, but uh, I put a papyrus graft stents in and um, obviously didn't control it anymore. But it is possible that this enlargement was an effect of the Paclitaxel? I don't know. Uh, we, what what we, we, we did years ago, um, um, looked at all the data about uh, aneurysm formation. And this is reported also f uh, for POBA, for tracheolytic stents, in the range of up to 2% of the procedures. And we found for the DCB trials at this time an aneurysm rate of 0.8%. So from the data, there is no hint. What we know is um, that, for example, if you do sub-intimal recanalization of CTOs, then and then you apply uh, the drug in the adventitia, finally, then you, you may have an increased rate of, of aneurysm formation. This is a finding from the peripheral arteries. Uh, but overall, there is, there is uh, no, uh, no reports about an increased rate, and nobody of us can c uh, confirm in this. In this spe uh, specific case, there was a slight dissection. So, um, well, this might bring some of the, m of the, of the drug into the subintimate space. Might this play a role? I, I don't know. I, 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 it would be nice to share your, your pictures, your, your images from it. I think this is a very interesting story, and uh, we have really to be cautious in new techniques that we, we have a look at possible problems. And uh, the lumen enlargement um, is potentially a problem, uh, but in all the long term data we have, uh, and in all the clinical data we have, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, a real issue in, 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 in clinical practice. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that you shared this uh, with us, but um, I haven't seen a, an aneurysm in one of my patients, never. I can tell you we have done about roughly 5,000 dcb only procedures in the last 12 years, and I have seen one with, after DCB treatment and some more after stent treatment, so, yeah. It's the same with me. I think it's. I have some cases with one after a POVA uh, aneurysm. But I think this uh, late lumen enlargement is a really interesting uh, effect. So one question for you, um, Bruno, and it's a provocative one. Let's see. Uh, we know that there is no class effect in DCBs, uh, but also we are understanding, as you mentioned, this effect of late luminal enlargement and how it appears in some cases while in others just you don't see it. And we don't know why, as, as our peer commented to us. So do you think that we will see this effect uh, in all the paclitaxel uh, DCVs that we have in the market? And, it, and if this is going to be the same for uh, Sirolimus, you have to bet. Mm. So uh, I would, wouldn't assume uh, the same effect for, uh, for all Pactitaxial balloons and for all Sirolimus balloons. So th that's the reason why we, we have to ask um, the companies to do uh, large randomized trials on their own to, to um, prove the safety and uh, especially the efficacy of the, of the respective balloons. And, and that's what, what we have to do in the future. And, and, and therefore, it makes no sense to publish uh, uh, from a certain balloon type, several registry data, but avoiding publishing uh, randomized trials. I think this is a very important message, especially at this meeting. Bruno, I have a question to you, if you have time. Um, why should anybody use a Paclitaxel balloon or a Cyrolin balloon? Uh, is there any preference from your side? Because I always ask myself, Paclitaxel works very well, mm -hmm. uh, has a potential advantage. 
and now everybody jumps on Sarolimus because in the stands it works much better. Um, do you have any preference or do you think, or who will be the winner? What do you think? Um, I think the winner would be the community if we could uh, broaden the indications for DCB and come out of the niche. Because you can, uh, what we do is we, we uh, lesion preparation is, uh, is done in every lesion and then we decide what to do and we have the 50 to 50% 50 ratio even in complex patients per lesion between DCB and, and DES. And this is, I assume this will be part of your talk. We know that we have stand related events year by year uh, in, the, in the range of two to four percent and this doesn't stop. And uh, we can improve the outcome of our patients if we reduce the total number of stands. And uh, the more we are able to convince people to use DCB, the, the better it is. So it's not, for me, it's, it's not a question of uh, which balloon is, is the best or, or, or not the best. For, for me, the important question is how can we um, convince interventional cardiologists to implement DCBs in their daily, daily practice? Yeah, there's a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm Lucio Padilla from Argentina. I'm leader in the Latin Bifurcation Registry, and in our data, we have 100 uh, patients with DCB, and the most important thing that we have uh, noticed is that in the main vessel, 9% was no prepare the black in the real life, and in the side branch, 28%, and in the, in the, in the outcomes, the, the patient that came with TLR, 75% was patient that from the beginning was not well prepared the plaque. So that is the thing. Then we can, we can talk about that if this balloon is similar than this, that I think it's not the same. But <clears throat> I think that there is a, a, a great opportunity to use more because in this registry, only 8% of the patient in bifurcation lesion use drug eluting balloon. And this is very low. So I think that in the future, maybe perhaps 30% in the future. And when to use the drug eluting balloon, why and how? That's the question. Perhaps tomorrow we can chat in the evascular meeting. Okay. So, um, the next talk comes from Victor, and it's about um, hybrid toolbox. Correct. Let's see if I convince some of the audience to use more hybrid approach. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Victor Jimenez. I'm interventional cardiology in, in Vigo, Spain. And let's talk a little bit more about the modern hybrid toolbox in the complex PCI where less is more clearly. So everybody knows that the improved short and meter outcomes of the latest generations of stents have far exceed those achieved with the previous generations of stents. However, maintaining its long-term clinical benefits in different clinical settings and in specific patient population is challenging and represent currently a concern for the community. And this is mainly because we are getting and uh, treating more younger patients population in our daily work at the cat lab, and they presented with early and very aggressive coronary artery disease. But also there is an increasing application of PCI in patients with more complex anatomies and more complex risk profiles. So in these scenarios, the long-term clinical benefit of DES, even using the latest generation on, on DES, may be compromised. So talking about long-term outcome after stent implantations, if, if we analyze the stable coronary artery disease and acute coronary syndromes, this is data that uh, Raban presented before. Uh, in this study, they analyzed more than 25,000 patients treated with BMS, first and second generation DES, included more than 50% of acute coronary syndrome patients, and the follow-up was pretty long, five years follow-up. 
So they found that the very late stent-related ischemic events, and this is including ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization and stent thrombosis occurred at a rate of 2% per year after PCI with all metallic stents. And with no plateau evident through the five-year follow-up. So this is very worrisome data, as you can see. But also if we analyze target lesion failure, which is a fairly uh, specific event for stent-related complications, occurred in around 5% of these populations after using second generation DES within the first year, and with 7.7% .7 of the patient between year one and five. Also, ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization shows very high features. If we talk about only stable patients, stable coronary artery disease patients, in this study they include more than 10,000 patients with a stable coronary artery disease, second generation DES, within five years follow-up. So they found that even after this first year period of very high risk of restenosis, the stable coronary artery disease patients continue to experience around 2 to 2.7% annual rate of stent-related events between one and five years. And also, once again, with no plateau evident over time. Also, analyzing target lesion failure and ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization, the numbers are pretty high. And if we see stent thrombosis at five years, there is no negligible numbers also. So we already know what are the potential causes for late state-related adverse events. But also we know that if we implanted a metallic stent in a coronary artery of a patient, we may impair restoration of the vasomotion in these stented segments. And also we may promote and accelerate neoterosclerosis. So it's important to understand that the length and the number of stents implanted matters. As we know that there are well-established independent predictors of instant restenosis and thrombosis, even using the latest generation of stents. So uh, to me, the shorter the stent length we implant, the better long-term outcomes we can provide to our patients. So why we should try to reduce the number and the length of stent usage? Well, this is a lot of data. This, is, this study included more than 9,000 patients underwent a single lesion PCI using second generation DES with two years follow-up and using intravascular ultrasound guidance in more than 36% of the patients. So they found out that the longer the length of a stent you use, you increase the risk of having target lesion failure. As you can see, if you implanted more than 40 millimeters of a stent in these patients, you will have an increase of target lesion revascularization, cardiac death, target lesion revascularization and failure, and stent thrombosis. So the stent length, irrespective of the use of IBUS or overlapping stents, were responsible for this poor outcome in this study. So it makes a lot of sense uh, try to use the hybrid approach, which means using DCV and DES in a specific patient's population. So in this analysis, including patients with multivessel disease successfully treated with DCV only or in combination with DES, what we call hybrid approach, and compared with a propensity score match in patients using second generation of this at two years follow-up, the hybrid approach lead to a reduction, significant reduction in MACE at two years. And also the hybrid approach patients significantly reduce the stent burden in multivessel PCI, as you can see in the graph. So using DCV only PCI or in combination with DES as a part of a hybrid procedure to reduce stent burden may be an alternative and useful treatment approach in different scenarios. Multivessel disease, diffuse coronary artery disease that we know that affects around 50 to 20% of all our procedures, complex lesions as CTO, bifurcations, coronary ectasias and aneurysms, high bleeding risk patients as uh, Raban mentioned before, in patients with DAP compliance issues, and also the most important one potentially, the young patients with prolonged life expectancy on where we don't want to implant a metallic stent forever. So uh, let's see a clinical case that I think that uh, includes anatomical complexity and also clinical features that are complex. This is a 70 years old male with a acute coronary syndrome. He is an ex-smoker. He has an hypertension, dyslipidemia, severe COPD, and he has an active prostatic cancer in current treatment. 
but he also has aller is allergic to aspirin, so he developed angioedema years ago, and now he's trying to tolerate a low dose of aspirin. So the AKG at the admission was ST depression in the anterolateral precordial leads. The transthoracic echo shows hypokinesia in the anterolateral segment with distal septum segments in the apex, and the left ventricular ejection fraction was 50%. So also the troponin was on the rise. So this is the coronary angiogram. You can see a diffuse disease and calcified disease of the LAD, mainly in the mid and distal segment in different, in different regions, including some uh, branches and some diagonal arteries. You can see also here in this slide that this is long and diffuse disease in a lady, but also has uh, severe lesions in the left circumflex and in the first marginal branch. Lucky for the patient, the right coronary artery was normal. So of course this patient was not uh, suitable for, for cabbage and we have to face this patient in the cat lab. So we are from this patient trying to reduce the length of, and the length and the number of stem because two reasons why because we don't want to end up with a with a ten with a three or four stents in the LAD a cage in the entire LAD we don't want to lose uh, diagonal branches also and we try to get the better a long-term outcome in this patient. So we started doing predilatation, progressive predilatation has uh, he has mentioned here before starting with semi-compliant balloons, non-compliant balloons, cutting balloons from two millimeters to 2.75 millimeters, and of course, always assessing the result and the progression of the predilatation. So as you can see here, there is uh, not optimal predilatation in the mid and distal segment. So we add to our toolbox um, the intravascular lithotripsy, the shock wave. So we apply lithotripsy to the mid and distal segments on portions. And now we can see in the in the angio uh, result that it's better predilated, these lesions. So we are okay with this. You can see also some type A and type B dissection in the mid and distal segment of the LED. But we are fine with that. So we continue with the angioplasty and we do our hybrid approach using three serolimus coated balloons. 2.25, 2.5, and, and 3.0 from the distal to the mid LAD. But also in this heavily calcified proximal segment of the LAD, we implanted a DES, a very small one, 3.5 to 14 millimeters, and we have to post dilate it because it was severely under expansion even after using lithotripsy. So the final angiographic result are this, I think was very good, we were happy with this result. Uh, no big dissections, no loses any side branch vessels. The patient tolerated well the procedure, even though it was a complex procedure and long procedure. And then the patient was sent home two days after with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So we scheduled a follow-up uh, of this patient six weeks after to try to see the evolution of this, of this treatment and also to assess the left circumflex and to analyze if we have to do something in this patient. But also he commented to us that he dropped aspirin four days after PCI without consulting anybody because he started feeling bad like, like he was the pelvic angioedema uh, like years before. So he dropped aspirin, so he went home with single antiplatelet therapy. So we were more, more curious to see that. And this is the final result after just six weeks of hybrid approach. You can see no dissection, uh, no loosening branches, and also, I would say, the an enlargement of the vessel after six weeks. So uh, we decided not to touch LA, uh, left circumflex and the patient was sent home and was asymptomatic, actually. So this was the approach, very diffuse disease in LAD. We use only 40 millimeters of DES, of metal, and then we use 55 millimeters of uh, drug-coated balloon with sirolimus drug. The result was really good at the end, and at the follow-up was also better. So just a couple of things to remember. Stent-related events continue to accrue at the rate of 2 to 2.7% 2 per year between one and five years after PCI. And this includes all metallic coronary stents and without distinction of clinical setting. The rate has not meaningfully improved as a stent technology has evolved from BMS to DES. And there is no plateau in this ongoing risk is evident, so presenting a lifelong patient concern. 
So the length and the number of stents matter and are independent predictors of in stent restenosis, thrombosis, and late ischemic events. So the shorter the length we implanted, the length of stent we implanted, the lower the long-term risk of coronary adverse events we will have. And many patients will live for many years with permanent implanted coronary stents. So novel devices-based treatment has hybrid approach. Combine it, of course, with more effective uh, medical treatment are needed to further improve long-term outcomes after PCI. And to be honest, to me, DCB and DES are complementary devices, not the opposite, and have to be used jointly and routinely in our daily practice. DCBs, to me, are a simple and effective solution to solve complex clinical and anatomical scenarios. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great presentation. Victor, um, regarding your toolbox, uh, what is your standard approach uh, to uh, prepare the lesions? Are you using the, 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 the normal semi-compliant balloons or non-compliant balloons or scoring or whatever? Potentially, this doing? is a, the key question. As you mentioned in your presentation, lesion preparation is key, it's fundamental. And it's going to lead you to finally decide if you're going to use DCB or you have to do something else, even prepare more deletions. So normally, every single patient and every single lesion are different, even in the same vessel, as you saw in, in, in the case that I presented. So normally, I st start using semi-compliant balloon in all my lesions. And I see the behavior of this semi-compliant balloon. If I see a waste in the balloon, then I have to upgrade my balloon to potential and non-compliance or go directly for cutting balloons. I have to be honest, I treat a lot of the novel lesions with cutting balloons because I think that leaving a small dissection allows that the drug goes into the vessel and I have seen the result at the follow-up. So uh, if that is not good, then I go further and I go to lithotripsy and also rotablation in some cases. So this is the full kit that we have. Um, there, there are two, uh, two, two concepts of lesion preparations. We have Simon sitting over there. Simon always talks from a gentle predilatation, which means he is very careful not to create dissections. I'm the opposite. I'm trying to challenge the vessel and, and uh, using in doubt a bigger sized balloon and, and to look if I have a dissection. What, what is your approach? I will say I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a star really gentle as Simon and go smoothly, but also aggressive. And I mean aggressive increasing, trying to get the best I can with plague preparation. That is a key, I, I, must, I must say it again, that is the key aspect. So I start smooth, I start progressing, increasing dilatation in size and also in aggressiveness with different devices. And no, and no, and no panic, no pain with dissections. Mm -hmm. We know from different publications that if the patient is okay, that the cat lab is not only the angio that you see the dissection, if the patient is okay, not just pain, just wait a bit, as Simon has a lot of experience with that. Say, uh, wait a little bit, use some nitro, see the patient if it's okay, and, and everything normally goes fine. I'm playing a little bit uh, Advocatus Diaboli here. Um, how do you explain to your chief financial, financial officer that you use uh, 10 times uh, the amount of balloons like anybody else in your hospital? Well, that's a good, a good question. Uh, I will tell him that we need to talk in, ten, in five to 10 years uh, to see that everybody that we implant a stem in a lower proportion would come back for a new catheter. So, I mean, it's difficult to say, but I mean, it's, it's important that we understand the value of trying to, to do our best for our patients for the long-term outcome. And, and this is try to reduce the number of stents and to provide a device that has shown that it's very safe. What, what, what do you have to do to convince other card cardiologists not to stand every lesion? What, 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 what do you have to do? Is, this, is it training? Is it trials? What is it? I think it's a, bit of, a little bit of both. Potentially somebody can tell us here. I mean, I think to me, to my personal view, and I was convinced because doing and seeing cases and bringing back to the cat lab some specific patients on where you feel that you don't feel really comfortable leaving that lesion, but you have to leave it because uh, it was like that. And bringing back the patient to the cat lab and see that what you did 
really works and the patient is better, it's good, and no symptoms, that is something reassuring and, and it's, it's a way to start, I would say. Great. One question from the audience. Wesley? Uh, regarding the hybrid approach, I think Antonio Colombo has another policy, just called DBT, DBDT for the distal vessels, or some IVAS after that. Do you think that could be a routine? Sometimes it's difficult, or just depending on angiographic findings that it's okay, completely normal, no dissection, and they go for hybrid DCP, DS for the proximal and diffuse disease, just, just doing ballooning? I think there is no rule here. I think you can, you can use every single different type styles of hybrid approach. But believe me, it depends on how do you feel during the case and how do your patient goes during the case. So, and you have to move from that. Predilatation from progressive to aggressive and then decide. There's Perfect. no specific rule. Great. Perfect last words. Uh, we are at the end of this very interesting meeting. I have to thank you all uh, for participating and discussing. Thank you very much.